Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us in the world. My name is Tiffany Bova. I couldn't be more thrilled to be with you here today on this edition of What's Next Live here across all these social platforms. I have the wonderful honor and pleasure of welcoming Peter to the show today. You know, look, we sort of met in a very interesting way. All of a sudden, you know, I'm sort of sitting at my desk one day and I get this email from our CEO, Mark Benioff. He says, hey, Tiffany, I want to introduce you to my friend, Peter. He's got something going on. I thought you guys might want to meet. Lo and behold, this is the guy I get to meet. So who is, who is he? All right. So Peter was just recently named by Fortune as one of the world's 50 greatest leaders. He's the founder and executive chairman of the XPRIZE Foundation, which leads the world in designing and operating large scale incentive competitions. Along with this guy named Elon Musk, you may know who he is, the duo launched the $100 million XPRIZE uh, a few months back, which we'll talk about. He's also the executive founder and director of Singularity University, a graduate level Silicon Valley institution that counsels the world's leaders on growing technologies. And he's also written three or four best-selling books. You know, he's a total underachiever. I'm a friend of Tiffany. That's what I am. <laughs> That's what you are. Welcome to the show, Peter. Thank you for joining us. Thank a you pleasure. For yeah. So in, what an incredible time right now in human history, right? As we're coming out of the pandemic and as the change that we're experiencing in technology is accelerating, uh, it's an amazing time to be alive. Well, it is. You know, I was reading this article the other day that I thought was really fascinating. And it said, why humans are living longer than they were last century, right? That everyone's living sort of 20 years longer, that it has everything to do with all the medical advancements we've made, the technology advancements we've made, right? All this progress that dealing with the pandemic we just dealt with is because we did dealt with SARS and we dealt with the AIDS epidemic and we dealt with, you know, all these other things and, and how the human sort of resilience, you know, always shines through even yeah. through tough times. Yeah, for sure. You know, and, and the, the challenge is that, um, a lot of people don't realize the incredible world we're living in, and and I I credit the what I call the crisis news network, right? Uh, whether it's CNN or Fox or New York Times or Wall Street Journal, it, it, all of the news media out there is bombarding us with negative news over and over and over again, and it turns out there's a good reason for that, um, and the reason is that their business model. If you stop and think about what is the how do how do news media make their their money, it's delivering our eyeballs to their advertisers. That's fundamentally it. And and evolutionarily, we pay ten times more attention to negative news than positive news. It's just you know, in the savannas of Africa, hundred thousand years ago, that would save your life if you know if you heard a rustle in the in the in the in the leaves and you thought lion versus wind or you saw you know, <laughs> cracks on the ground and you thought snake versus stick that would save your life on occasion but today that just has us on red alert all the time and i asked myself the question uh a while ago is that the way the world really is it's all 10 times more negative stuff going on than positive stuff or is that just the way it's being filtered to me and i truly believe that uh, we don't see a balance uh, because of that business model and because of the way our brains are wired, but we're living in an extraordinary time of amazing technological breakthroughs. Yeah, yeah and, and you know, you, uh, in that vein of not always having good news or bad news, you know, you are trying to kind of flip it on its head. You've just launched something called Future Loop, um, and I'd love for you to share kind of what that is all about, because I, I got to tell you, when you were sort of sharing it with me in our in our pre-conversation, I was like, I want to sign up today. So yeah. tell us about it. So I got so disturbed by this lack of, uh, of balance of news out there. I ended up um, uh, investing in, in a company I, I created called Future Loop with a, a friend of mine, Evan Pagan. And then we just hired some, some really incredible, powerful, young AI uh, superstars, right? In, in, in machine learning in neural nets and, and said, let's scan the world's news uh, across news media, hundreds of thousands of articles per day. And let's look for those articles which have a, a positive sentiment because you can measure sentiment very easily. And let's look at those articles for those articles that are um, focused in the field 
of exponential technologies, computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain. And then let's look for those articles that are positive sentiment around these technologies impacting industries where you can pick the industry you're interested. If you're interested in the clothing industry, wouldn't it be interesting to see how are these technologies uh, transforming clothing or transportation or healthcare or education, whatever you care about, and have the system bring the summary of those breakthroughs to you every day. So that's what we built. Uh, and you can go to futureloop.com. It's free um, and sign up for it. And uh, we'll have more and more iterations that are getting better and better. And ultimately what I want is I want to, I want to shape my mindset. And, you know, uh, you know this, Tiffany, from the incredible work that Salesforce does in the, the whole, uh, whole realm of, uh, of, of AI and, and, and machine learning um, and data mining. Uh, and AI is built by showing it data. And uh, you shape a neural net by, by the data that you, that you give it. And our brains are neural nets. And so, you know, the old adage, if you show a neural net just images of cats after cats after cats and you show it a dog, it's going to say it's a cat because that's all it's been trained on. <laughs> and if, if you're showing our brains just disaster after disaster, after shooting, after bombing, after political, you know, whatever, and just constant negative news, it's no surprise that people are going to be, oh, this world is awful. But I want... To, I wanted to create a, a, a platform that gives people positive news, right? So I'm creating a version of Future Loop, which is called Longevity Insider, which is I want to see all of the breakthroughs every day that are shaping um, and extending the healthy human lifespan. Because I think mindset is one of the most important things that you have. Uh, and we are living longer, and we're living longer because of a whole range of reasons. But I think if you believe you're going to be living longer, you're going to take better care of yourself. And it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy in that regard. So Future Loop is, is my answer for uh, a world full of, of, uh, of crisis delivering news networks. So, I mean, check it out. Uh, it's, it's fun. Yeah. And so what, can you share once again where people can go? We got a question. Yeah, just, where we're... Yeah, just go to uh, futureloop.com, one word, F-U-T-U-R-E-L-O-O-P.com. And, um, and it gives you uh, what I call the convergence newsletter. I actually created a, uh, a virtual version of myself. I had, I had the Future Loop uh, Neural Net digest all of my blogs, all of my books, my Twitter input. And so it actually looks for articles out there in the world that uh, are biased towards a abundance, bold, you know, uh, future forward point of view. Uh, on the industries of interest. So yeah, futureloop.com is it's uh, just to give you a, a a balancing feed to have you realize we're living, I think, during the most extraordinary time ever in human history to be alive. Well, I, I you know, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. You know, while I think that, you know, the news tends to focus on the negative, so much positive has come out of the last year and a half. We have so much more work to do. Yeah. But just all the things that we've been able to to turn the corner on. And I and I think Part of it is people, unlikely characters working together and unlikely businesses working together and competing countries and companies working together to solve these big problems. And that leads me to this next conversation, which is XPRIZE with that yeah. guy, Elon Musk, right? That, okay, if you're going to come up with how do we make the world a better place? What are the things we can do? You know, let's gamify you know, solving these big problems. And you put out, I think, a $100 million prize. So maybe you could share... Um, you know, the entire genesis of that and, and where you are today with it. Yeah, sure. Um, <clears throat> those who don't know, uh, the X Prize is an organization. Uh, we pick audacious targets, um, not theoretical targets, but actually, can you build something that does this? And then we challenge teams around the world to go and do that. And then there's a large pot of gold in the rainbow if you pull it off. So um, the first X Prize. Uh, I was reading Lindbergh's book that in 1927, he crossed the Atlantic, uh, not on a whim, but to actually win a $25,000 prize. And I was like, that's pretty cool. This, this guy, Raymond Ortega, puts up 25,000 bucks and nine different team, uh, teams spend 400,000 to win this guy's 25,000 bucks. <laughs> and I was like, what's, what's not to like about that? It's like, and 
he only paid on success. It's like, that's a great business model. And I had been, uh, you know, I'm a space cadet from my childhood. It was you know, Star Trek and Apollo that got me started. I like to say that audacious Apollo mission and that incredible, you know, uh, scientific documentary called Star Trek uh, got me uh, going on my desire to open up space. And um, I realized there was no way that I believed that the government would get us there in time. And I said, I'm going to create a $10 million prize for private space flight. It was uh, very quickly shaped this prize, 10 million bucks for the first person to build a three person spaceship, carrying the three people up to a hundred kilometers, land again within two weeks, do the, and, and make the trip one more time. Uh, we had 26 teams from seven countries spent a hundred well, million so dollars. So, yeah. So hold on though. Did you do the same thing? Like, I'm not going to pay you unless you actually do it. Yeah, it was, <laughs> like, it was, it was, yeah, it was basically, uh, I offered the prize Tiffany on the stage, on a stage in St. Louis, uh, with 20 astronauts on stage, the head of NASA, the head of the FAA, the Lindbergh family with me. And I announced this $10 million prize. The challenge is I didn't have $10 million at the time. <laughs> uh, I didn't have any teams and I, I knew it was important to launch this idea above the line of super credibility. It took me five years to raise the capital. I got it from an incredible woman, Anusha Ansari, who funded our first uh, X prize. We called it the Ansari X prize. And uh, the prize was won in 2004, eight years later, uh, by uh, Bert Rutan, backed by Paul Allen, and uh, built Spaceship One. Richard Branson came in and bought the rights to the winning technology to create Virgin Galactic. And then since then, we've launched, uh, you know, about 15 or 16 prizes, a couple of hundred million dollars in prizes in different areas, in education, in mapping the ocean floor and pulling water out of the atmosphere at you know, from renewable energy at two cents a liter to provide abundant water, um, a whole range of things. Anyway, long story short, uh, Elon, who I've known for 22 years since uh, since about 99, 2000, um, uh, had funded one of our first early prizes on global learning. And on January 7th, uh, he became the wealthiest person on the planet for a few days when he, he crested over over. Bezos. And he was getting a lot of flack for not um, for not being philanthropic. And so I, I reached out to him. I, I, uh, I texted him and say, let's do another X prize. He said, what do you have in mind? I said, well, we've got this prize we've wanted to do on removing CO2 from the atmosphere at gigaton levels. Uh, uh, something that, uh, you know, your, your chairman and CEO, Mark Benioff, is also passionate about. And uh, to Elon's credit, he's incredibly decisive when he wants to do something. He said, let's do it. And uh, uh, we announced it on Earth Day. And so it's a $100 million prize, the biggest prize ever in human history. Uh, and teams need to demonstrate the ability they have to actually build a technology to pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, not at a gigaton level. They have to be able to pull out uh, at a at a megaton level, um, but with the ability to demonstrate that it can scale <clears throat> to gigaton, um, and there are student prizes. There's going to be upfront uh, prizes, and then there's you know the majority, uh, the fifty of the hundred million goes to the overall winner. But then there are ten million dollar prizes, and you can go to xprize.org, x p r i z e dot o r g, uh, to get more information. Uh, and this prize, we've had the most interest than any prize ever. Uh, and you think it's the dollar amount, or do you think it's because people are becoming much more conscious? Yeah, I think it's it's both. I think we're we're dropping uh, a seed crystal into a super saturated solution. I think people uh, are looking for an excuse to spend their time, energy, technology on the subject, um, and so it's super exciting. Uh, and uh, I'm pumped about uh, where this will go um, and the ideas. I mean, so it's the prize is open to any idea. So, you know, Mark Benioff is partial to the trillion trees um, approach, which I think is amazing, right? So it turns out we have a couple of, uh, of uh, a trillion trees on the planet. If you added another trillion trees, 
the CO2 that they extract would bring us back to pre-industrial age CO2 levels. Uh, but there's also approaches with mineralization or using uh, the ocean or what's called direct air carbon capture, where you build machines that suck in the CO2 um, and and uh, sequester it, right? And so, you know, we're, we're going to be using exponential technologies, even quantum computing chemistry, uh, as it comes online in the next few years, will create uh, new, uh, new materials that might sequester carbon better than what we know of right now. Uh, but the beautiful thing about these X prizes is you don't need to know how a person's going to do it. You just need to know what they have to achieve. And our job is to make the intersection of audacious but achievable. If it's too easy to achieve, we didn't do anything. If it's too audacious and no one ever does it, then you've missed the boat. And so, and I think that has a lot to do with how passionate you are also about entrepreneurship, right? Because yeah. the way your brain thinks is so not the way my brain thinks. <laughs> like, really? <laughs> at all. Like, listening to you talk, I'm like, wow, I don't think like this at all, right? Like, you can have, you know, kind of that finite view and you can have an infinite view. You can have an anything's possible view and you can have a, wow, that might be really hard view. And I have a, I think everything's possible if you put really smart people together, but you're a smart person who puts really smart people together. And I think that that's the, the power of those two things and your imagination. And I think it's very similar to someone like a Elon Musk or Mark Benioff or, you know, uh, Richard Branson, right? You have to have big imagination and audacious goals with the ability to achieve them. Right. And mm -hmm. I think that that's the foundation of entrepreneurship. Well, thank you. And, I, you know, here's the here's the realization that I think is so important for people we're going to be seeing more and more audacious things happen. Why? Because uh, the the technology we're using to do that is getting cheaper, and it's becoming more accessible to not just a few people in ivory towers or in the top funded companies. They're being it's being democratized around the world, and um, there are more and more people on the planet. Um, who are interested in solving big problems. And so all of these are, uh, and there's one other big thing, which is there's more capital than ever before flowing. Do you know that during the pandemic in 2020, I mean, in the midst of a global pandemic, there was more capital invested in venture funding than any other year in human history? I mean, you would have thought people would have pulled back, but no, it was an acceleration and more capital invested in companies around the world anytime in human history. So it's like all of these factors are accelerating the rate at which technology and breakthroughs are, are happening. And that's, for me, that's amazing. You have to have well, and even, yeah. and even yeah. during 2020 was more small businesses, you know, there, you know, during the recession, uh, kind of eight, nine, 10, you know, there was a big decline of small businesses starting or entrepreneurs starting. And during 2020, you know, lots of people started businesses. Maybe it was that opportunity to say, I wouldn't have done it in any other situation, but now I've, I've either lost my job or I'm working from home and I have some time. Um, yep. And so I'm going to give it a shot. So maybe, you know, maybe some of it is that as well, where people just needed the opportunity um, to make those investments and start those businesses. And maybe that's why more capital came in. There were more ideas. Yeah. Uh, I agreed. And it, those ideas being capitalized are seeds being planted that are going to bear fruit over the next, you know, two, three, four years of new incredible companies in healthcare, in education, in every industry. Um, you know, and it's they're being fertilized by companies like Salesforce, which is enabling, uh, you know, small teams to do incredible things. Well, that, that sort of leads me to the next phase of this conversation, right? So I've been a fan of Singularity University for a really long time. Um, I have followed the work, I enjoy what they do. And I think it's been uh, sort of this front and center conversation about how we need to change the future of education and higher education that a lot of the things you and I are talking about, resilience, starting a business, how to be an imaginative and curious is Nece not necessarily taught in school in that way, right? It's sort of a <laughs> curriculum, get them in, get them out, right? Um, exactly. And so I, I'd love to hear your perspective on where you think, um, one, you know, education can go, knowing everything we know, but then also talk about the Abundance 360 that you're doing with Singularity, Singularity University and maybe share with our listeners what that is. 
Yeah, sure. So it was about 12 years ago that I partnered with uh, Ray Kurzweil. Ray is considered one of the leading futurists and thinkers in AI. And I said, you know, Ray, there's no place on the planet. And he had just written a book called The Singularity is Near, which is a fantastic book. He's coming out with a new version called The Singularity is Nearer. I don't know if, <laughs> if uh, the publisher is going to keep that title, but we'll see. Um, and I said, there's no place on the planet you could go uh, as an entrepreneur, as a leader, to really understand uh, how all these different converging exponential technologies are creating new business models and transforming industries and companies. You know, when you go right now, you go to the best universities in the world, uh, whether you know it's University of Tokyo or MIT or Harvard or Stanford, and you go and you get a very narrow degree. You know, you get a degree in molecular genetics on a particular enhancer sequence in a particular gene in a particular, you know, you know <laughs> uh, whatever. And that's what your doctorate degree is in, right? It's like super narrowly focused. But where do you go and get like the broad view of like, oh, interesting, all of the, here's what the state of these different technologies are. And so we created that university called Singularity University. And um, I, I run, uh, as executive founder, uh, I run the highest tier part of that university called Abundance 360. Um, and I... Uh, I have a, a group of 360 uh, entrepreneur CEOs that I mentor. I mentor throughout the year. It's a year-long coaching program with a three-day event in Los Angeles. Um, and then there's an, a program called Abundance Digital, which is for about 4,000 entrepreneurs. Uh, it's all, all, all digital. And so Abundance 360, and folks can go to a360.com to learn more. But what I've realized is the most important thing that I can teach and support entrepreneurs and leaders and CEOs on is their mindset. And I think mindset is one of the most underappreciated things. So what I've structured the entire program around four mindsets. And if I said to you, you know, uh, if you look at folks like Mark Benioff and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and Larry Page and so forth, if you took away everything they had, took away their money, their relationships, um, you know, their technology, but you kept, they kept their mindset. I bet you that they would uh, regain a lot of their success, right? The mindset is what differentiates them. It's not the dollars they started with or the technology they started with. Um, it's their mindset. So most of us don't actually actively choose our mindsets. We inherit them from brothers, sisters, parents, what we happen to encounter and so forth. So I've ended up really coaching leaders on four mindsets. Uh, the first mindset that I think is really important is an abundance mindset. I'm, 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 uh, I'm using my abundance mindset up and, and it said, you know, uh, how would you live life if there was no scarcity? And so an abundance mindset basically says, listen, every year there is more and more opportunity. Uh, you know, in a world where you have a pie and and as there are more people coming to dinner, you have to slice the pie into thinner and thinner slices. That's a scarcity mindset. In an abundance mindset, you simply say, we're going to bake more pies. And, um, and, you know, we're seeing this in every way, shape and form, right? It used to be that we'd kill whales on the ocean to get whale oil to light our nights. Then we ravaged mountainsides and we drilled kilometers under the ocean floor. And today we've got 8,000 times more energy from the sun hitting the surface of the earth from solar energy than we consume as a species. And so what I do is help people see how to flip their model from scarcity to abundance in their businesses, which makes it you know explode massively. Uh, the second mindset is an exponential mindset. And it's, uh, you know, we are linear thinkers. We think one, two, three, four, five, but the technology we're using is growing exponentially, right? In, in 30 linear steps, you're 30 meters away. In 30 exponential steps, you're a billion meters away. Put differently, you've gone around the planet 26 times. So how do you think exponentially, understand where, you know, computation, sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain, where these technologies are going over the next two to five years. So I really focus... Uh, in helping people understand what's where it is now and what its trajectory is. Uh, 
Third mindset, which I think is so important for entrepreneurs, and I know uh, Mark and the Salesforce leadership team like yourself have this, is a moonshot mindset, uh, which is most of the world is trying to go 10% bigger, uh, and that's incremental growth. But in a moonshot mindset, you're trying to go 10 times bigger, 1,000%. But you need to start with a clean sheet of paper. And how do you create a moonshot mindset in yourself, your leadership team, and then the final moonshot and the final mindset, which I love, and we started the conversation around this, is what I call a longevity mindset. And um, we have been living longer, and uh, we're about to see a revolution in the length of the lifespan. Uh, Tony Robbins, who's a dear friend, and I are writing a book called uh, Life Force. Uh, we're chronicling all of the technologies that are available today and in phase one, two, three clinical trials that uh, I believe are going to add 20 or 30 healthy years on people's life. Uh, and those are going to enable you then to uh, intercept additional technologies to add even more. But mindset around longevity is important. But I spend a lot of my time with my A360 members, helping them access these technologies, and understand what's coming. Well, you know, we talk a lot about the beginner's mindset, <clears throat> which is very similar, right? This, yeah. if you have this kind of, I'm an expert. I have an expert mindset. I'm not open to new ideas. You know, it's always, always the status quo. We don't do it that way here. We tried it. It failed. It's never going to work. Our competition doesn't do it. Those things. Yeah. So I talk a lot about that beginner's mind, right? Which is allowing yourself some space every day to think about something that even if you try it and it fails, it's okay. And how much more of that space can you give over time as you start to get more and more comfortable with uncertainty Mm -hmm. which is difficult for many, <clears throat> right? And uh, I had uh, Amy Webb on my podcast a couple of weeks ago and she said, you know, I ask executives, are they right all the time? And they say, well, of course not. Of course I'm not right all the time, right? But then you expect the people who work for you to be right all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, how I, you know how, I how I define an expert? An expert is, is uh, the person who can tell you exactly how it can't be done. Yes. Right. And so it's you know, all the day before something is truly a breakthrough, truly a breakthrough, not an incremental improvement, truly a breakthrough. It's a crazy idea. Otherwise, it wouldn't be it would be an expected idea. And so I'm asking companies and, and executive teams, where inside your organization are you experimenting with crazy ideas? And if you're not, then you're limiting yourself to linear incremental growth. Yeah. And I, and I think that's where people get stuck. You know, when we started talking about coming in and out of the pandemic, it was like, let's stabilize everything that's happening, obviously. And then it was kind of, how do we get back to work in some way that it, not to the office, but maybe just back to work, right? Initially, if you think about the first three to six months, it was very challenging. What are we going to do? And now it's sort of as a community, as a globe, as a business community, we're like, how do we get back to growth? Now, of course, many were growing, <laughs> Um, if you were in sectors, but if you were in sectors that were heavily hit, like hospitality, you're yeah. sort of getting back into growth, right? And but we've also found the fragility of um, of the supply chain. We've uncovered so much of how delicate that process is, and where things can actually come to a halt. And so, uh, I think that really requires this longevity mindset, and, and maybe not a moonshot, right? Because mm -hmm. that might be too far out, um, and and or this there's an opportunity in the abundance world, right? Yeah. You know, it, when you're in the abundance mindset, uh, you're less worried about competition and you're more, you're more open to collaboration, right? And that's very much what Salesforce is all about is, is just massive levels of, of collaboration. But um, I'm excited, uh, Tiffany, to, to bring you on to my abundance stage uh, uh, and in the beginning of 22 when we hold our, our opening summit. And anybody who's interested in um, in the coaching program that I personally do, if you just go to Abundance360.com, you can learn more about it. Um, but it's an extraordinary time to be alive. It's the best time ever to be an entrepreneur. It's the best time ever to be a leader. Uh, and it's really, you know, a lot of the stuff we talk, I, I teach around is like, what's your massively transformative purpose? What's, what is it you wake up with in the morning excited to do uh, in, in, in making a better world? Because... We're at a time where, as an entrepreneur, you can impact the lives of a billion people. And if you can do that, why wouldn't you want to? You know, how do you scale your mindset and your thinking? 
Well, Peter, this has been just an absolute pleasure uh, spending time with you. We've got people who have been joining us from Canada and Scotland uh, that wanted to hear sort of everything you had to say. So it has been my honor, my pleasure, uh, not only to call you a friend, but to have you on the show here today. Um, and while we're like five miles apart, <laughs> we had to do this via video today, which is too bad. Next time we'll do it in the studio. But uh, thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. My pleasure, Tiffany. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. See you again next time.